Uh, tonight we're going to continue our series on church membership. And when we first started talking about church membership, uh, the passage that we're going to look at tonight was one of the first passages that landed on me. Because when we look at this passage, you can't possibly even apply these things except in the context of meaningful church membership. And so our passage for tonight is going to be Colossians chapter 3, uh, verses 5 through 11. So you can go ahead and uh, turn there, but I'm going to take a few minutes to set it up. Colossians 3, verses 5 through 11, and then next week we're going to do verses 12 through 17. And as we see these two things, we're going to see that living these things out in Christian community demands meaningful church membership in a local congregation. Um. So far in our church membership series, we've studied many things on this topic. And part of what we've studied so far is the importance on the public, corporate, orderly worship service. We studied God's commandments for us to not forsake the corporate gatherings. We studied the components of the corporate gatherings. And we saw that the various components of the corporate gatherings, they are commanded and they also have promises tied to them. And... <clears throat> Throughout our study, we realize that we can't be strong in the Lord if we make the habit of neglecting the gathering. And we saw in Hebrews 10 especially the terrifying truth that warned us that one of the sure first steps towards apostasy is forsaking the corporate gathering of the saints. Making that, and it's not, I missed church three times last year. It's, it says, it is the habit of some. This is something that habitually is a problem, is forsaking the corporate gathering. Those are first steps towards apostasy. And so there is no supplement in the Christian life for a dedicated, regular attendance of the orderly worship gathering. Now tonight what we're going to look at is the necessity of Christians to develop, nurture, and regularly build meaningful, rich, spiritual relationships with the members of the church outside of the corporate gathering. Biblically speaking, church is not just attending a service. The service is an important part of it, but that's not all it is. Church is a shared life together in Christ where we know each other, we love each other, we serve each other, and we're on mission together with each other. And much of the Christian life is not something that only takes place in the corporate gathering. There are many, many, many incredibly powerful things that occur in the corporate gathering that you can't get anywhere else. But at the same time, there are many wonderful works of God that take place outside of the corporate gathering that you can't get anywhere else. Unique and glorious things of Christ are, are uh, made possible and come forth through public prayer. Unique and glorious things of Christ hit us in corporate praise. Unique and glorious things uh, in Christ take place at the Lord's table. Unique and glorious things in Christ take place from the pulpit. Yet at the same time, unique and glorious things are worked into God's people by the Holy Spirit in living rooms. It's worked into God's people at lunches and at dining tables and at, at, at uh, social gatherings and graduations and play dates and birthday parties and private conversations. Public sermons are crucial to the life of the church. So also are private Christ-centered conversations. So... If you are somebody who is a faithful attender of corporate worship, but you have little or nothing to do with the body outside of that, you should be commended for your faithfulness to be part of the service, but you need to repent and grow in building relationships outside of the service. On the other hand, if you're good at building relationships outside of the body, but you're flaky about the service, you need to humble yourself and repent and obey God's commands and believe His promises and stop living in the habit of forsaking the gathering. Healthy church membership and healthy church members, they are keenly aware of the need for regularly gathering in corporate worship, and they are also keenly aware of the need to build personal relationships outside of the church. Now, 
We can show this from many places. Tonight, uh, in our setup for the text, one of our cues is going to be in the Apostle Paul himself. In Acts chapter 20, verses 20 through 21, Paul was saying his farewell to the Ephesian elders. And when he did this, he reminded them of his, of his personal example of the Christian life, and he expected them to follow his example. And here's the example that Paul set. He says in Acts 20, verse 20 through 21, I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you in public and from house to house, testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So here we see in that text, Paul is, <clears throat> Paul is, uh, <laughs> he didn't shrink back from declaring all that was profitable for their walk publicly, and he didn't shrink back from doing it privately. He testified publicly about Christ. And then in private, he also testified of Christ. And no doubt in private, he could field their questions, and he could help them with the specific things they were struggling with, and he could address it in their homes. Yes, he would address things publicly. Yes, he would proclaim things through his sermons. <clears throat> and also, he would do so house to house. So sometimes when we are struggling with doubts, because Paul said he helped them with their faith in Christ. If we're struggling with doubts, we don't quite understand something. Sometimes it's a sermon that God uses that helps us greatly. And then other times, sometimes we hear a sermon and we feel more confused than when we started. And then we have to have conversations with people outside of the service. And God uses those people to help us grow in our faith. The public life of the Christian and the private life of the Christian is extremely important. And so <clears throat> Paul says that not only did he publicly teach uh, and, and teach, uh, not only did he teach publicly and from house to house, things that were profitable for their faith, but also he taught things pertaining to what he says in verse 21, repentance towards God. And again, as we walk in the Christian life and as we live our lifestyle of repentance, sometimes we're in sin or we're in some temptation and the public sermon nails exactly what we need to repent from. The Spirit comes through His Word. It feels like the preacher is speaking directly to our hearts. And God leads us to repentance through the sermon. Other times, though, we need somebody who knows us. We need someone who has a personal relationship with us to speak directly into specific situations in our lives. Paul did both. He publicly preached for repentance, and he also addressed their need to repent house to house through private interactions. So what this means is he was a meaningful part of the people's lives outside of the corporate gathering. And he had such a meaningful role in their lives that he was able to discern what they specifically needed to repent from. And he's able to address it to their specific situations as he ministers house to house. And so as Christians, we need both the public gathering and we need the private interactions with believers to help our faith and to help us grow in repentance. We know from Acts, Acts chapter 19, verse 9, that Paul was a church member who was deeply devoted to the public life of the church. Acts 19, 9, he preaches every day in the hall of Tyrannus. That is a public thing. But we also know that this was true of, uh, of Paul as well. 1 Thessalonians 2, 8. Here's what Paul says. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you would become very dear to us. Paul's ministry was a preaching public ministry for sure, but it was also a ministry of sharing his very life with people. And it is a deadly mistake to make, whether it's a ministry mistake or a church membership mistake, to only be willing to do public things. It's a mistake to the people that we minister to, to only be willing to share the gospel, but not to care about anything going on in their daily lives. 
People think this kind of thing is faithful, but the truth is it's arrogant and unloving. When Paul wrapped people into their lives and into his life and he wrapped himself into theirs, I mean, it wasn't just a constant Bible study. There's things in our lives, things that we deal with, things that we go through. They all have, they all have spiritual meaning, but we can't speak into those things if, if nobody knows each other. And so if you're not, when you go to minister to somebody, if you don't care about smaller things in their lives, do you think people are going to trust you to speak about the greater spiritual realities? Paul loved his people. And he wove those people into his life and he wove himself into their lives. And in that context, he's able to speak the word of God to them publicly and privately. And so there is a a pastoral model out there that says, where some pastors say, you know, I'm just the preaching pastor. I don't really get in people's lives. That's not my job. I just do the preaching. Well, if you read the word of God, that is not a biblical or faithful model of ministry. We need to stop calling it a valid uh, alternative. It's a loveless model of ministry. It's sin. And pastors who do that need to repent. Paul is in the lives of his people and he publicly ministers. It is clear. It is all over the book of Acts. Jesus Christ did that. Paul did that. Peter did that. Every single faithful minister of God publicly proclaims the word and has meaningful private interactions with the people. There are not any exceptions. And so when we look at and what is church leadership? It's an example. It's not so the church leaders aren't the only ones called to do these things. We exemplify regular Christianity. So we exemplify public the public Christian life, that we're to be a committed part of it. But we also are to exemplify the private Christian life, where we're involved with people. That's not something only pastors do. All believers are called to do that. And I think it's just horrible when pastors say, I'm only going to be the preacher, I'm not involved in people's lives. Well, okay, what's that congregation who's supposed to imitate your faith? What are they then going to do? Church is a corporate gathering, and we're not going to be in people's lives. I, I hate that stuff. And so what we see in Paul here to set up the passage is we see a kind of biblical church membership that is committed to the public life of the church and the private life of the church. And so, Lord willing, we will see in our text tonight and also next week that this type of commitment to church membership isn't just something pastors are called to, but rather the entire church is called to it. So please turn to Colossians 3, verses 5 through 11. Next week, we'll tackle verses 12 through 17. And I want you to keep in your minds, this is written to the church. This isn't a manual for pastors. This is what all church members are to be uh, committed to. Colossians chapter 3, verses 5 through 11. Now, in the beginning of this chapter, Paul reminds his readers in verses 1 through 4 that we have spiritually been raised with Christ, meaning that by the Spirit, we now have Christ's very life dwelling within us. And he tells us in verses 1 through 4 that we're to seek the things that are above where Christ is. And we're to have our minds dwelling not on earthly things, but on heavenly glories. And he tells us that the old person who did not know Christ, that person has died. And that we have a new life that's hidden with Christ in God. And Paul also comforts and encourages us that when Christ appears at his return, we also are going to appear with him. Now, these things in verses one through four, they're wonderful theological, spiritual truths about real Christians. And if these spiritual glories concerning the Christian life are genuinely true of us, then Paul makes it very clear that they're going to manifest themselves in how we live especially how we live in the church. And so all of what we're going to cover in the next two weeks in verses 5 through 17 are things that are to be lived out in committed, meaningful church membership. The things that we're going to look at, we will see by their very nature, they assume and demand that we have meaningful relationships, not only with each other in the corporate gathering, but also in each other's lives outside the service. So... In light of all the wonderful things uh, that he says about Christians in verses 1 through 4, he's going to tell us what we are not to do and what we're to put to death in verses 5 through 9. 
Then he's going to tell us what we are to do in verses 12 through 17. We'll cover that next week. So let's begin with what we're not to do in light of who we are in Christ according to verses 1 through 4. Here's what we are to not do. Verse 5. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. So the first part of verse 5 says, Put to death, therefore, that which is earthly in you. Do you see how that command contrasts with verses 1 through 4? Verse 1 through 4, Paul tells us we have all these heavenly glories. Our life is hidden with Christ in God. And He's our life. He's going to appear. We're going to appear with Him in glory. Set your mind on heavenly things. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. That's what we're to do. This heavenly mindedness. And then the contrast to that is put to death what is earthly. And because we, we, we now have this life in Christ, because we've been spiritually raised with Him, and we have this new heavenly glory, we are to put to death anything that runs counter to the new spiritual life that we have. And when you, when you put something to death, that's a violent act. Word on the street is that there are mountain lions near my house. If you've been to my house, I know that's weird. I I didn't believe it for a long time. But that is the word on the street. I didn't really believe it until last night at like 2 in the morning. Our window was open, and I heard some big thing die. It was not some little, like some little, you know, uh, Yo Quiero Taco Bell dog, you know, or something. Not something like that. Some big animal got demolished last night. And I mean, it, 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 I, I sleep with earplugs in because I'm a light sleeper. It woke me out of a dead sleep. And I just was this poor thing. I don't know where the body is today, but it's not looking good. Because this, I, it sounded like a big dog. This big dog was put to death. And when you put things to death, you're not petting it. You're not coddling it. You are violently striking blows to it until it ceases to live. Put to death that which is earthly within you. This is a call to holy violence. It's not talking about killing people. It's talking about killing sin. And we are to take this holy violence to our sins. Kill it. Put it to death. When there are things that are earthly within us, we don't play with it, we don't feed it, we don't nurture it, we don't coddle it, we don't pet it, we don't call it nice names, we kill it. What kind of earthly things does Paul have in mind here? Well, he tells you. Look at the first three statements in verse 3 after he says, put to death that that which is earthly within you. Here's what he has in mind. Sexual immorality, impurity, and passion. I think those three things are linked together. Sexual immorality in its broadest sense is a desire and a pursuit of and an engaging in any sexual relationship that is not within the confines of marriage between one man and one woman. Biblically speaking, sexually immoral relationships are any sexual relationships prior to marriage. They are any sexual relationships outside of marriage. They are homosexual sexual relationships or any other act of sexuality that doesn't occur between one man and one woman in marriage. That's sexual immorality according to the word of God. And as a Christian who has new life in Christ, this is to be put to death. And as we look in verse 5, sexual immorality has associated with it the words, look, impurity and passions. Sexually immoral desires are impure desires. Sinful sexual cravings are our sin nature's passions. Passions that are corrupted. Passions that long for evil things. So listen, there's nothing wrong with sex according to God's design. Done within marriage between a man and a woman, it's good and it's godly. But if the desire for that is to pursue it outside of marriage, 
or in a homosexual relationship or prior to marriage, that is a corruption of a good desire. And it's condemned here. And Paul tells us these things are to be put to death. If you want to think in a heavenly minded way, one of the clearest representations of Christ's relationship to the church is the description of Christ as the bridegroom and the church as the bride. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11, his mission, his mission is to present the church to Christ as a pure virgin in all purity. So as, as believers, we have one true husband, the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the bridegroom of the church. And we are not as his bride to be idolaters. We do not give ourselves to other gods. We are patiently waiting for his return. And when we engage in sexuality before marriage, we show that we're basically like uh, Christians who are impatient about the return of Christ and who forsake him because he's taking too long. When we as Christians engage in adulterous sexual relationships, we testify in those moments that Christ is not a sufficient husband for us, that we need another lover, and we give ourselves to that. And so when we are enslaved by impure thoughts and the sexually immoral passions in our bodies, we lie against everything Colossians 3 verses 1 through 4 says that we are. This sin, it is not Compatible with our new nature, and therefore Paul tells us to put it to death. And as verse 5 comes to a completion, Paul also tells us to put away covetousness, which is idolatry. Covetousness is strongly desiring some earthly thing that we don't have. Usually, covetousness is associated with money and possessions, though we know from the law that covetousness can apply to other things. It says, do not covet your neighbor's wife. Um, but covetousness is typically uh, a, a insatiable desire for money and possessions that, that we harbor in our hearts in such a way that our covetous, greedy desires, it fills our thoughts, it fills the meditation of our heart, and these desires, these covetous longings, they begin to control us. We are called to be controlled by God, by the Spirit of God, and to serve God. We are not our own. We're bought with a price, Paul says eh, to the Corinthians. He alone is our master. But when we are controlled and ruled by covetousness, when we are controlled by the love of money, we're no longer serving God, we're serving money. And Jesus told us in Matthew 6, 24, that we cannot serve both God and money. And when money is our master, when we are covetousness, when we are covetous, excuse me, some of the evidences of that in our lives might look like this. We make all of our life decisions around the pursuit of more money. We go where we gain bigger houses. We go where we gain bigger salaries. And we pursue a lifestyle that accommodates our greed. And in order to do this, we will compromise our walk with God. We'll remove ourselves from faithful bodies. We will send our wives into the workforce so she can no longer be home to fulfill her calling to bring the kids up in the word of God. We will forsake meaningful church membership for excessive work that we need to do to pay for our things. And as we live this type of life, we show that no matter what our lips say, our true God is money. And we are serving our covetous desires. That's why verse Verse 5 calls covetousness idolatry because functionally money becomes our true God. And in this earthly desire, this sinful craving for money, we are telling the world that even though the verse 1 through 4 things are said to be true of Christians, we are saying God is not enough. We're declaring that though we claim Jesus is our all in all with our lips, our lives are saying that he's really just a bumper sticker to us. If our true God is money, 
then it is what we will serve, it is what we will crave, and it's what we will build our life on. And then there are all kinds of false teachers in the church who will tell you that that's wisdom. Look at Colossians 3. Is Paul calling this wisdom? He says this is covetousness is idolatry, and it's something that has to be put to death. So if you truly understand the enslaving nature of this sin, then Hebrews 13, 5 makes so much sense to you. And here's a, here's a, I believe the most powerful promise against the love of money is Hebrews 13, 5. It says, keep your life free from the love of money. How do you do that? It says, be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. The reason, according to Hebrews 13, 5, that our life is to be free from the love of money is because Christ will not leave us. In other words, Christ is such a rich, glorious, and present possession for us that I don't need to live a life that tries to fill my emptiness with riches because I'm enjoying Christ in such a way that my heart rejoices in Him and is totally content with what I have because nothing compares to Christ. And if some situation arises that offers me more money and bigger houses and, and more indulgence and earthly possessions, but to have that, I have to compromise spiritual priorities in my life. If I go do it, I'm a lover of money. Put it to death, Paul says. Unless we think here that what Paul is saying is not really a big deal, I want you to tremble at verse 6. Look at verse 6. <clears throat> On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. God does not brush these things off as no big deal. God also does not believe that as long as you pray a prayer to ask Jesus to come into your heart, you're now free to live in sexual immorality and greed and impurity and passions. Instead, if you walk in these things, God has a promise in verse 6 of what your destiny will be. That destiny is to fall under the fierce wrath of God. God is the most powerful being there is. And all of us eternally are going to experience that power in profound ways. If you're in Christ, you're going to experience that power according to Colossians 3 verse 1 through 4. If you are not in Christ, you are going to experience that power according to verse 6, which means you will be subjected forever to eternal conscious torment in hell where you experience nothing but the power of the wrath of God for all time. Vanity Fair, MTV, Godless Media, all kinds of, uh, name your thing. All of this stuff might tell us how cool and wonderful sexual immorality is. All of these things might tell us, uh, hey man, I got to get my paper and I got to make my money long and all this stuff. And that's what, man, that's what it means to have life. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to have girls. All this sort of thing. Colossians 3, 6 tells you something else. Says the wrath of God is upon these things. The Wall Street Journal, financial advisors, and Christian wolves and false teachers might tell us how wonderful and wise living for money is, but God says it begets eternal wrath. Paul knows that sinners sin in these ways. Christ died for sinners. Paul tells us near the beginning of this book in Colossians chapter 1, verse 21 through 23, which we're going to look at in a minute. He tells us that we are saved and forgiven through faith that Jesus died for our sins to reconcile us to God. He tells us that. And now here in chapter 3, we can see that as we put our faith in Christ to save us from these things, as we have confidence that we are what verses 1 through 4 of chapter 3 says we are, our faith must be accompanied by repentance or we will fall under the wrath of God. Where do I get that? 
uh, verse 7 and the beginning of verse 8 tells us this. Let's take a look. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away. Verse 7 tells us we used to walk in these things, but now in Christ they must be put away. We have to turn from them. We have to stop walking in them. We have to stop comforting ourselves that we are His when we give ourselves to a lifestyle of the love of money, sexual immorality, or any other sin. And if you do not turn from sin, if you are not repentant, if you're not following Christ for real, you are not a Christian, and your eternal destiny will be to perish under the wrath of God forever. Verse 8, God is speaking about sin. Verse 8, the beginning of it, God is not making it unclear. This is what God says in verse 8. He's talking to all of us. But now you must put them all away if you are in Christ. That's God talking. Without repentance, we perish. As we finish verse 8 and go into verse 9, we see the expansion of Paul's characteristic list of sins that accompany the old man. We see the expansion of this list of sins that brings the wrath of God and this expansion of the characteristic list of sins that must be put away. Let's move to the next one. Verse 8 it says, But now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, Malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Here's a description of a way of life that's full of hatred and murder, especially towards the people of God. We have to repent of what verse 8 calls a heart of anger, wrath, and malice. This speaks to a sinful anger aroused within us. A heart that's full of vengeful malice that wants to destroy other people. That's eager to pour out our evil wrath upon them. And it is scary at times and it's alarming to see how quickly and easily these types of things can be aroused in our hearts. And rather than working through problems, this type of person nurtures an evil, demonic heart that is erupting with hatred. We seek the destruction of those who wronged us. We don't know how to forgive. And our hearts can become so darkened by this evil that we seek to put people to death. Whether it's literal murder or we simply just seek to execute them out of our lives... For no good purpose. The sin, this sin here is a picture of a cruel dead heart that is so distant from the love of God that all it knows is hatred. And if this type of heart is not repented from, if this kind of deep bitterness and malice and cruelty is harbored, if it's lied about, if it's justified, if it's lived into, we're going to inherit the wrath of God. 1 John 3.15 Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Let's be heavenly minded about this. Christ died for sinners. But when we hate our brothers and then claim to be Christians, we testify Christ murders sinners. And that he hates his own people. And that he's a killer. And when we manifest this sort of maliciousness in our hearts and when we are full of wrath, then we do the rest of verse 8. It says, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, and then what's next? Slander and obscene talk come from our mouth. What's slander? Slander is lying about someone for the purpose of destroying them. It's a murderous heart. And the reason it is murderous is it because it seeks to make other people hate other people through the lies that we spread. And slander can also be accompanied by obscene talk. And obscene talk is any speech that is wantonly sinful and destructive. It's obscene before God. And I think that the main idea here is a kind of talk that includes the use of 
filthy language and uh, crude and raunchy speech. And sometimes it's the t- uh, this is the type of obscene, t- uh, obscene talk is the type of speech that accompanies our slander. When we slander people, we, maybe we cuss about them or slander them by wrongly accusing them of engaging in obscene and vile acts that aren't even true. And this verse makes it clear that our tongue can be an accursed thing before God and we have to put to death the sins of malice. Unchecked, unrepentant malice and wrath in our hearts gives birth to slander. Lastly, in this list of sinning, which again, the sins Paul lists here, Paul has lots of lists like this in his letters. It's important for you guys to know these sins are characteristic lists. They're not exhaustive lists. It doesn't mean if you look at this list and you're harboring some sort of sin that's not named in this list. Oh, good. I'm glad he didn't talk about that one. They're characteristic, not exhaustive. Now, lastly, here in this list of sinning, we see this in verse 9. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you've put off the old self with its practices. So Paul tells us here, the other thing that we're to put off is lying. And oh, how many ways there are to lie. We just saw that slander is a type of lying, but it's not the only type of lying. Some people are just flat out over the top liars who lie about anything and everything. I mean, they they just completely fabricate things either to get attention or avoid some consequence or gain some sort of uh, of an advantage. And if you have ever been involved with a liar like that, it's very obvious. Some people are just extreme over the top liars. And there's probably people in your mind right now, people that you know who are like, that. oh yeah, so-and-so, so-and-so. Even those people a lot of times know, they're like, I've heard so, so many people tell me, I don't know why I lie so much. I lie when the truth would sound better. Though there, there are those kinds of liars, right? Those are easy to spot. There are other types of liars. 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, tells us about theological liars, that there are false teachers who teach things about God that are untrue, that are going to destroy people. Those people are called liars. Paul says, through the insincerity of liars who have seared consciences, people are destroyed through their theological lying. So another liar, according to the scripture, is those who tell lies about God. Still, others lie in, other, in more subtle and crafty ways. They take true things that happened, but they twist those true things in such a way so that the fundamental truthfulness of a situation is now altered. And they alter it through what the liar chooses to overemphasize and through what the liar chooses to de-emphasize. And that creates a completely different picture. See, do we have any pictures up? Uh, Okay, what is the main thing going on right now on the pulpit? I'm preaching, okay? What if Matt was going to tell a story to Emmanuel over here about what's going on in the pulpit, and he says, oh man, there's this microphone there, and then the microphone's just there, and it's just awesome and amazing, it's black, and it's got a really cool handle, and man, this microphone is so unbelievable, there's some green carpet, there, there's some music stands, it's amazing, you, I am enthralled by this microphone, it's so amazing, there's some dude standing there, it's crazy, you gotta see this microphone, what kind of picture did Matt paint? He paints a picture Whereas the main thing happening right here where I stand is this microphone being glorious. Yeah, he mentioned there's some guy up there. Did he tell the truth? He did not. He did and he didn't. There really is a microphone here. Matt might really like the microphone. But is that what's really going on right now? Is that the real, true picture? No. The main thing going on right now is the preaching of the Word of God. But Matt minimized that in his description. And he he lifted up this microphone. Did any of you even think about the microphone this whole time? No! That's an example of lying with the truth. Matt created a completely different picture with all true things. That's how a lot of liars operate. 
Other forms of lying is the lie of flattery. In flattery, we tell everyone how great they are so that we can use them to gain some sort of advantage. We don't really care about that person. We don't really care about the glory of God. But according to Romans 16, verse 17 through 18, these are real important verses. In fact, I'm going to read them. According to Romans 16, verse 17 through 18, we flatter people's socks off to pursue some earthly appetite we have. Listen to Romans 16, verse 17. I appeal to you, brothers, watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. Avoid them. So he's he's talking to a church, a local congregation with members, and he's saying, watch out for these kinds of people. What do they do? Well, he says, what? They create divisions and obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you've been taught. How do they do that? They do it by doing verse 18. For such persons, they don't serve our Lord Christ. They serve their own appetites. And by smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. These people are liars. And their big weapon is flattery. They use flattery, maybe it's to gain favors, maybe it's to gain praise from men or enhance their reputation or enhance their standing or they're manipulating somebody to do something they want. Whatever it is, flattery is the dishonest tool to accomplish the sinful agenda. And Romans 16 verse 17 through 18 tells us, watch out for those people. That's a type of lying. Still other liars, according to the word of God, are those who have the heart of malice towards someone. They will simply, they they have a heart of malice that we saw in Colossians 3, but they, they, they act like around the person that everything's cool. And rather than being honest and working through problems, they just harbor malice in their hearts while their lips tell you, oh yeah, man, everything's cool. And they just kind of remove you from their lives without ever even really engaging you. They give you the cold shoulder, they ignore you, they distance themselves from you, they won't interact with you because in their hearts they have malice, but in their words they lie. This kind of liar is also in the scriptures. Proverbs chapter 23, verse 6 of 7, verse 6 and 7. Listen to this kind of liar being described. Do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. Do not desire his delicacies, for he is like one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So here's a man, he's doing these good works of feeding you his food. What's the reality? He's stingy, but he's giving you his food. What does that make him look like? A generous person. It's called lying. And he says, hey, eat and drink. Oh, I mean, look at the words. But what's his heart? Oh, dang, you got a second plate? Really? Man, he's he's taking my extra stuff and inwardly it's like, man, I'm feeding this dude. Man, this guy, man, inwardly he's despising his good works that are putting on a front. That's called a liar. Proverbs 23 tells us that kind of person exists. And so in our lives, we might fool man. In fact, I believe we can get so comfortable in our lying that we even fool ourselves and believe our own lies. 2 Timothy 3 says these kinds of people are deceivers and they are also being deceived themselves. I think by their own lies. I've met plenty of people who believe their own lies. And so the horrible thing about lying and really any sin is But especially lying, you can get so comfortable with your lying that eventually you don't even know what the truth is anymore. Lying's a horrible sin. And we just talked about all the earthly manifestations of it. But we're called to be heavenly minded, right? So let's think from a theological standpoint why lying is so bad. Lying's an assault on God himself. We have a Christ who calls himself the truth, John 14, 6. In Colossians 1, 5, Paul says the gospel which saves us is called the word of truth. Jesus says in John 17, 17, that God sanctifies us by his word, which is the truth. 
And so when people claim to be Christians and then they live a life of lies, they testify that they are fraudulent and they live contrary to the gospel, which is the word of truth, contrary to the entire Bible, which is the truth, and contrary to Christ himself, who is the truth. And when we live like this, we're in grave danger of falling under the wrath of God. All of these types of sins that we have talked about today from the Word of God, they are associated with what verse 9 calls the old self. Look at verse 9. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. So here's a general description of sin now. Paul honed in on some specifics. Now I have general. Anything associated with the old man and its practices. Prior to coming to know, no, excuse me. Prior to us coming to know Christ, these types of sins and others they characterize our lives. And when we come to Jesus, we gain new life in Him, which was described for us in Colossians three, verse one through four. And when we turn from walking in the things that are characterized by the old self, we are putting off the old self. So, so far, kind of like last week's message. All this has just been like, bang, 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 bang. But I haven't seen anything encouraging yet uh, in the text. So that's why it's been that way, because that's what's been in the text. But I see something now. So the comfort for real Christians that I see in this text, real Christians who as Christians maybe have committed some of these sins or maybe struggle with some of these things, the comfort is Paul knows real Christians will have these issues arise from within us. Real Christians will have sexually immoral, impure desires aroused within them. Real Christians will battle covetousness. Real Christians will battle malice and slander. Real Christians will battle lying. We have remaining sin in us. And Paul tells us in this text that when these things arise within us, he doesn't say if, you, if, these, if this, this old man arises within you, then you're not saved. He doesn't say that. He says when it happens, what are we to do? Put it to death. It's going to rise up within you. It's going to. That's why Paul tells you to kill it. He says to put these things to death in verse 5. In verse 8, Paul says, put them all away. In verse 9, Paul says, put off the old self with his practices. All of those descriptions in verse 5, verse 8, and verse 9, they're all different expressions to tell us the same truth that Christians are to fight their sin. Christians are to repent of their sin and they're to turn from their sin when they encounter sin in themselves as believers. So in seeking to discern your own walk, I want you to quickly turn to Colossians 1 verse 21 through 23. It says, and you who once were alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. It sounds really familiar, right? It sounds like a Colossians 3 person. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you blameless, holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard. So here, this, this passage right here clearly tells us Christ died for us when we were hostile towards him and doing evil deeds. He died for us. And it, it tells us this death was so powerful. It was so sin forgiving that when we trust it by faith, it will be sufficient to provide us with the forgiveness that we need. So much so that we genuinely gain the standing of being declared holy and blameless in God's sight. That's a powerful death. Why is it possible according to these verses? It's possible because when Christ died on the cross, he fully removed the penalty of our sin when we put our faith in Jesus. Now, verse 23 tells us that this is going to apply to us if we continue in the faith. If we continue to hold to this hope of the gospel, stable and not moved from it. In other words, we have to continue all of our lives as believers to believe the gospel that Christ died for our sins and that through his death we're reconciled to God and presented in God's sight as holy and blameless. 
And if you turn from any other hope, you're going to be lost. That's what Colossians 1, 21 through 23 says. So in light of this, how do we think about remaining sin in light of the two things we saw tonight? Well, we just saw we're saved not by our works, clearly in Colossians 1, it's by the death of Christ, right? That we receive by faith. And then we look at how Paul addresses Christians in chapter 3. He doesn't say Christians are never going to sin. Nor does he say our sinning doesn't matter because we're saved by the cross. Instead, he tells us to put sin to death. Put it away. Put off the old self. And I believe when Paul's saying these things in chapter 3, he does so assuming that we remember what he said in chapter 1. That we are going to continue to put our faith in Christ. Trusting that the cross cleanses us from sin, which is exactly what he told us to do in chapter 1, verse 23. A real Christian, then, trusts that the cross is sufficient to forgive us. Trusts that we have a relationship with God now. We've been reconciled to him through the cross. Trust that this cross cleanses us so thoroughly that our, we are holy and blameless in his sight. And then in that trust sets its mind on heavenly things. This new heavenly identity we have according to verses 1 through 4. And as we have our mind set there and we're trusting in the cross. As we see sin arise from within us, we kill it. We put it off. It's an intense battle. Real Christians don't always win every battle. But we do fight the battle. We win the battle a lot. And we're fully engaged in this war. And if we're not involved, if we're not engaged in putting to death what's earthly within us, if we're not engaged in uh, fleeing these things and putting off the old man, then it is good evidence that we are not converted real Christians fight their sin they're not sinless they have sins they bring those sins to the cross and they fight and the good news for a real Christian is that all the sin that we fight and make war against and put to death it's all forgiven sin because of the cross Sometimes as believers, we do not emotionally feel like Christians. Sometimes we feel like we are nothing but our sin. And so, because our sinful feelings and our temptations are so strong, we just give in to them rather than putting them to death. And sometimes we do this in the name of being real. We don't feel holy. Sometimes we feel sinful. We feel, we're overcome with malice. We're overcome with greed. We're overcome with sexual lust. We don't feel holy and blameless according to chapter 1. We don't feel like we're seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We, we don't feel that way at all. We feel nothing but earthly. So what does a Christian do when you feel that way? Well, some Christians, because they want to, quote, keep it real, they give in to their sin. Because they're 100 they're not going to lie. This is how I feel. I don't want to be a hypocrite. That is just totally misguided. Listen, when you have those strong feelings as a Christian and God feels as distant from you as, you know, the Andromeda galaxy, it doesn't mean you're not a Christian. Those feelings have a word according to the Bible. What's it called? Temptation. Temptation is called temptation because it's tempting. Because it feels strong and it puts baits in front of you and says, come here. And it's enticing. And when you're tempted, that's not who you really are. You are not your sin. You are not your temptation. You are not your earthly nature. You are a child of God who's been reconciled through the cross who is seated with Christ in the heavenly places, who has who's been raised with Christ, whose life is hidden with Christ in God, and who will appear with Him in glory someday. And sometimes your feelings are going to tell you that's not what you are. You're your sin. And, when, and so therefore, give in to your sin. And when you feel that, by faith, you take the commandments in this text and kill. You kill sin. Shut up, sin. Shut up, lust. 
looking at this person that is that's not who I am. Lord, help me. Help me. Help me. My feelings are all out of whack. My head is spinning. My heart's all twisted. Oh, Lord, I pray, help me. Deliver me from this evil. Why do I feel this way? This is not who I am. And by faith, you hold on and you don't give in. And you pray and you remember promises. You say, help me, Lord God. And if it doesn't work, you've got some people in your life. They're called the church. People whom you are members of. And they can help you. And you put to death what is earthly within you. And you move forward in faith no matter what you feel. Praying that God will, in due time, God will restore you to a right mind. All the malice will dissipate. You'll see clearly again. All the covetousness can go away. Christ will be your treasure again. All the lusts will eventually subside. And you will long for the pure uh, love of Jesus Christ. It will. You just got to kill in the meantime. And put off the old man. And so if this message is convicting you, if it's being used by God to facilitate the fear of the Lord, if you see that you've committed these sins, if you see these evil things in your heart, then you have to continue in the faith and in the hope that Jesus died for you so you can be forgiven. And then you've got to take this sin seriously and you have to kill. But when you do this, Hebrews 9.14 says God will cleanse you from an evil conscience from acts that live, lead to death that you might serve the living God. When you do this, God says in Psalm 51.10, He will renew a right spirit within you. When you do this and your sins feel more than the hairs on your head, but you repent and you fight, Psalm 32, 1-11 says God will again refresh you with joy. When you set your mind on heavenly things, again, once more, the day's going to come. You'll rejoice in God again. Psalm 42 tells us, Why are you downcast, O my soul? Hope in God, I will again praise Him. And the Word of God says, 2 Corinthians 7.10, that any sin you ever repent of, you will never regret. Right? Godly sorrow leads to repentance unto salvation without regret. You won't regret it. Now, Paul tells us more about this process of bringing our uh, sins to the cross and fixing our minds on heavenly glory and killing sin. He tells us more about this in verses 9 and 10. So let's go ahead and, and look at those quickly. In verse 9, uh, it says, Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. So here we see turning from sin is, yes, putting off the old self and its wicked practices. But it's more than that. We don't just stop with putting off the old self. We also turn and put on the new self. Paul describes this as the new us who is made, in, uh, who is made alive in Christ that's being continually renewed in the knowledge of the image of our Creator. So in the, the Christian life's not just avoiding certain things. That's part of it. But it's also proactively pursuing what we're to be like before God. And that's what we're going to cover next week in verses 12 through 17. We'll get real practical about the kinds of things we're to pursue in Christ. But you probably don't want me to cover that now because we'll be here till 7. So um, we put things off. And we put things on. And it's rooted in theology. It's rooted in who God has made us in Christ. So every single Christian, we're in a constant battle to put off the old self and put on the new self. And regardless of what our personal backgrounds are, or our personality types, or where we live, or what spiritual gifts we have, or what our role in the church is, or how much money we have, everyone who is in Christ is in this battle. Where do I get that? Verse 11. Here, there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, Barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and is in all. Whole list of different types of people. 
Doesn't matter who you are. Doesn't matter where you're from. Christ is the all to every believer. Christ is in all. He is indwelling all believers. And every single believer described in verse 11 is in the battle of verses 5 through 10. Every one of us. And so the spiritual fight that we're in, it's not just something that we're engaged in individually. Rather, it's something we're engaged in corporately. So what are the implications of this stuff for church membership? If we are all in this together, then we're not only involved in our own battles to become uh, conformed to the image of Christ, but also we're involved in helping each other with theirs. This passage, listen, it's written to a church. This isn't written to an individual. It's the book of Colossians. It's a church in Colossae. It's a local body. They know each other. They come together. They worship regularly. There are names and faces in this church. There are, when Paul writes this, there are real spiritual battles that are really happening in this church. This isn't a manual of someday, if this ever happens, this is what you should do. It's real names and faces, real people in this church, and they are members of this church, and they're in each other's lives. And as a congregation of believers, we are to be together in each other's lives and to help each other, help each other grow. These things are hard. And there's not one person in this room or in any church who isn't subject to this war, who doesn't have to put to death earthly desires. We all have them. I got them. You got them. And we have to put them together. Or I'm sorry, we have to put them together. Put them to death and help each other together. And so, yes, sermons and public gatherings, they're crucial in helping us. But there's a help that we gain in, the, uh, in relationships outside of the church that's different than the corporate gatherings. And it's essential. I mean, just look at the nature of the sins that we, that we looked at. Sexual immorality. That's something that takes place in the corporate gathering. No, by and large. I mean, I've heard some crazy stories before, but we won't go there. But by and large, no. This is something that takes place outside the gathering. Now, usually, I know there are some exceptions, but oftentimes it's in connection to things that, in connection to things that happen outside the gathering that lying and slander and malice and wrath creep into our hearts. Many times it is outside the gathering when we pursue and indulge our covetousness. I know these things can happen in the gathering, but they happen a lot outside of it. So if we're going to help each other have victory over these things, then like Paul, we not only need to gather corporately, but also we need to have meaningful involvement in each other's lives house to house. Because what did Paul do house to house? He declared to the Ephesians things that were profitable for their repentance. Well, how can we help each other with that if we don't know each other? It's in private interactions where we can give unique kinds of help to fight against specific sins. It's in private interactions where we can receive insights from the Word that are specific to real life situations that we're dealing with. It's in private interactions that we can gain some crucial biblical truth from another Christian to help us get through what we're going through. In house-to-house interactions, someone might point out an area of sin in our lives that we couldn't perceive and that when we heard the sermon, we didn't catch on to, but someone who's got a finger and a pulse on our life can see it and help us. So through meaningful church membership, if we struggle with these kinds of sins, it's going to be revealed as you engage the body of Christ. As you engage the body of Christ for real, there are going to be Christians who will upset you. Satan will tempt you towards malice. Satan will tempt you towards wrath and slander. Satan might tempt you to use people for money, tempt you towards greed, maybe a sort of immorality. And the question then becomes, what are you going to do about it when you face these things? 
Are you going to press into the body? Are you going to continue to grow, continue to love the church, continue to press on and putting off the old man and putting on the new man and helping your brothers and sisters do the same? Or are you going to start slandering the church? Are you going to start destroying the church? Are you going to run from the church? Are you going to lie about who you really are and flee God's people for the purpose, the purpose of gathering a new people who are going to make you feel comfortable in your accursed worldliness and are going to do nothing but tickle your ears unto hell where the wrath of God will abide on you? Listen, the church is the place God has given to us to help us uh, learn about areas we need to grow in. And when a fake Christian encounters the real church, when they want to harbor their sins, then what they'll do is, with the very malice, wrath, and anger, and lies, and slander that this text condemns, they're going to attack the church, abandon the church, and gather people to tickle their itching ears so that they can stay comfortable in their sins. And so some questions I have in relation to church membership of these things is, Do you know saints well enough who can help you with your walk? Are there Christians who know you well enough that could help you? And if the answer is no, then an important question is to ask yourself, why not? Listen, we're not going to win this fight on our own. We will not put sin to death on our own. We will eventually on our own be overcome by the fight and we will lose if we don't have meaningful relationships in the body. In church membership, it puts names and faces to those with whom we congregate. Those with whom we will use our gifts to help win the fight of faith. Those who will also use their gifts to help us. And when a real saint presses into the body, despite all the church's imperfections, those kinds of Christians, they're going to grow greatly. And they shine like stars in the kingdom of God. And they bear all kinds of wonderful fruit to God. And their walks are real. And they have great fruits of repentance and of love and obedience. And they bring great glory to Christ, even though it can be messy on the way. Over the long term, you look at their life and it's just been so much growth. That's when real Christians encounter the body. So... Like Paul, in meaningful church membership, we're to help each other have faith in Christ and we're to help each other grow in repentance towards God. Christ died to place us in a body of believers so that together we can walk the narrow path and successfully defeat temptations, find a place where we truly belong with God and with His people, and so together we can persevere in the Christian life unto glory. And listen, as we live out Colossians 3, the nitty gritty Colossians 3, 5 through 17, as we live that out together, hoping in Christ, through all the mess of things, God makes the bonds of real saints stronger. The people I am the most close with in my life, they're not people that I've never seen sin in. They're not people who've never sinned against me. They're not people I've never sinned against. They're people I've watched and joined up with. They've helped me put my old self to death. I've helped them with it. And through that battle, God makes you tight. And God makes you close. And He makes you one in the Spirit. So, Jesus Christ was local. When Jesus went to, came to save us, He didn't create a website. He didn't send us a text. It wasn't even a phone call. It wasn't FaceTime even. He became a man. 1 John 1, He lived among us. That's what we have seen. That's what we have heard. That's what we have touched. We proclaim to you. He was among us. Among the people. And that's what He saved us into. To live that same type of life. Among each other. With each other. Loving each other. If Christ became us and lived among us. God became flesh and tabernacled. And dwelt among us. This is what we are to do with each other. We dwell among each other. We are in each other's lives and love each other. I don't know how you can live. Go this week. Read Colossians 3, 5-17 through in your private time. And ask yourself... 
How are the positive things described in verses 12 through 17 and the negative things in verses 5 through 10? How could I possibly rightly live into this stuff apart from meaningful church membership? You can't do it. Who do you bear with? Who do you love? Who are you hospitable towards? Who do you do good towards? People in the church that you're members with. So, anyways, that's tonight. Next week, you guys know the text. It's 3, 12 through 17. We'll cover the uh, positive side. So, uh, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your gospel that is so powerful. It wipes away the guilt of every sin we've ever committed to the tune that we can authentically be holy and blameless in your sight and be really reconciled to you through the faith that we have in the gospel, through the hope that we have in the gospel. We praise you for that. And Lord, we thank you for the heavenly identity you've given us, that we're raised with Christ, that we're seated with him in the heavenly places, that our life is hidden with Christ in God, and that when he appears, we're going to appear with him in glory too. We praise you for that. And Lord, we also thank you that you don't just leave these things as some spiritual pie in the sky, weird realities, but that they're things that touch the deepest parts of us. There's things that touch lying, things that touch greed, things that touch immorality, things that touch malice, things that touch any kind of sin. And it's a a living spiritual presence in us that enables us to kill sin and put off the old man and, and, and flee from these things. We thank you. It is deliverance from the kingdom of darkness. It is deliverance from walking in evil. Thank you so much for that. And Lord, we thank you also for what we'll see next week, that it's deliverance into love and bearing with one another and kindness and hospitality and singing with each other and sharing the word with each other. These positive glorious things, we thank you for that as well. And Father, we thank you for your design of the church the local church, that there are real people that we can live these realities with, people who can help us put off the old man, people who we help put off the old man, people who can help us put on the new man, people whom we can help. God, we thank you for the church, and we just pray that you will help us to have meaningful engagement with your church, that you will help us to persevere through rough patches, help us to rejoice in in, uh, times of victory and sweet fellowship and oneness. And God, together... Uh, with faith that's protected by you, we will with one voice glorify the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and together we will make it to glory and enjoy you forever. So we thank you for your word and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.